Environmental groups say North Carolina's Noose River system is one of the most polluted in the nation. Scientists say one reason is that the river is receiving more fertilizers or nutrients than it can handle. Dr. Tom Linden looks at the problem. One warning, some of the images in this story may be disturbing. Retired fisherman Tom Tosto lives just off the banks of the Noose in South River, North Carolina. He's known the river for seven decades. I've been commercial fishing ever since I was wearing three-quarter pants. I've been right out in, in these waters that we're looking at with my mother of picking up oysters by looking at them on the bottom and harvesting them with a hand reek. But these days, the business of harvesting oysters has all but dried up. Well, it isn't any. There's no, there's no industry in this area. Uh, this boat right here that, that I can throw a brick at uh, fitted up and, and uh, went out uh, last year in the uh, News River on those rocks and uh, he found uh, very dismal. I think he come in with eight bushels and there was no market for them. Biologists say the oyster population in the News River system today is just one percent of what it was at the beginning of the 20th century. Their investigations show a number of factors working against the oysters, including parasitic diseases and overfishing. But researchers say one of the biggest threats comes from a process called nutrient loading. The system is stressed, terribly stressed. Marine biologists like Joe Ramos say nutrient loading is the addition of excessive amounts of fertilizers into the river from a variety of sources. The organism and the, the, the base of the food chain in the water column are microalgae. They're microscopic plants. They need nutrients just like crop plants do. Uh, and in this case, they're getting too much nutrient. That can cause explosive growth called algal blooms that rob the water of oxygen and threaten animal life in the river. This is how it works. Fish eat algae, but when there are more algae than the fish can eat, the algae sink to the bottom of the river. There, bacteria consume the algae, a process that starves the water of oxygen. This can leave a dead zone on the river bottom with almost no oxygen at all. Ramos says nutrient loading comes from many sources. Fertilizers from agriculture, hog and poultry waste, municipal sewage, and even chemicals in car exhaust add nutrients to the river. The source of the nutrients is all of us. Okay, there's plenty, there's plenty of blame to go around. This is a clump of oysters and I've, I'm holding it as it grew. Marine biologist Charles Peterson studies what happens to oysters when nutrient loading triggers algal blooms. We in 1997 had a study of what the oysters were doing and how well they did that happened to go across a three week period during which this oxygen depletion occurred. What we were able to see was that below a certain depth, a depth of about five meters, every oyster died over that three week period. Not a single living oyster. And it's not just oysters that are dying. State Division of Water Quality records show lack of oxygen is the suspect in fish kills every year. Tens or even hundreds of thousands of fish can die during a single kill. The fish and oysters can't handle the vast amount of fertilizers, animal waste, human waste, and other nutrients loading the Noose River system. And these same nutrients are feeding a microscopic creature that some say threaten not only the fish, but people. That creature is Fisteria, seen here circling a red blood cell in this microscope image. Botanist Joanne Burkholder was one of the scientists who first identified the one-cell organism. In the case of Fisteria, we have tracked this organism and done many experiments with it, showing that Fisteria can be stimulated by just about any kind of nutrient pollution, from human waste to swine waste to poultry waste and cropland runoff and fertilizer from, from our lawns. Over the last several years, former Noose River keeper Rick Dove has monitored sources of nutrient pollution, which he says contributes to the growth of fisteria and the sickening of fish. In the mid-1990s, Dove and others started noticing dying fish with open sores. We've always had fish die. I mean, that happens in an estuary. 
But we've never had fish dying with sores all over their body like we do now, and then we're seeing more and more of that. And sores also started showing up on fishermen like David Jones, who once operated a market in New Bern. It looks like his sores, when they really open, look just like on the fish. But Jones claims it was more than sores that plagued him. In 1994, he began to suffer lapses in memory and started having problems concentrating. His wife, Margaret, explains. He would forget he'd be in there working with a customer and just walk right out. He would just be sitting at the dinner table eating with us, carrying on a conversation, and the next thing you know, he'd be gone. You'd see him out in the yard walking around. Due to the water and the neglect of the water, um, I've been made uh, seriously ill. Some experts say sores, memory losses, and other neurologic problems may result from toxic chemicals released by fisteria during fish kills. But some researchers, like epidemiologist David Savitz, say serious questions remain about whether fisteria can make people sick. There's evidence to suggest it might. Uh, there's a legitimate hypothesis out there that has some justification. But as far as saying, does fisteria cause people to be sick or does it not, uh, the answer right now is we don't know. One reason for the uncertainty is that there haven't been major fisteria-related fish kills in the last few years. And aquatic ecologist Joanne Burkholder says it's during those fish kills when scientists can investigate the problem. She says it's like trying to study burn victims without a fire. Recent hurricanes may have washed much of the fisteria out of the river for now, but she says pollution still threatens the noose. We shouldn't be depending, in my view, on hurricanes to control these organisms like hysteria. We should be doing everything we can to reduce nutrient loading to the noose. It's a water quality question, in my view, and it's a very serious one, because either directly or indirectly, if we continue to allow our water quality to slide, it's our own health, ultimately, that will be affected, not just fish health. The state did pass legislation requiring a 30% reduction in nutrients going into the Noose River, but some scientists say 30% may not be enough to restore the health of the river. Tomorrow night in the second part of our series on water quality, Dr. Linden visits one of the state's most unique ecosystems, the Green Swamp in southeastern North Carolina.